What's up guys, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, SQL injection attack, listing the database contents on non-Oracle databases. First question, why specifically non-Oracle databases? SQL databases have what's known as the information schema. It's a set of tables that list all of the information regarding tables in the database. In other words, it's a table storing information about tables. For example, you can query information underscore schema dot tables to list the tables in the database. Now this is true for most SQL databases, but it's not true of Oracle. Table's going to be called something different in Oracle. We can see an example, select all from all underscore tables. So the idea is it's something that's different for Oracle. That's why in the lab title we have listing the database content on non-Oracle databases. Now we get a lot of information regarding solving this lab simply from the lab description. This lab contains an SQL injection vulnerability in the product category filter. The results from the query are returned in the application's response, so you can use a union attack to retrieve data from other tables. Okay, so it's going to be the product category filter that's going to be part of the query string on the URL, and we can see it's vulnerable to a union attack. The application has a login function. In other words, it supports users and accounts. They can log in with their username and password. And naturally the database typically holds that information, the list of usernames and their associated passwords, usually stored as a password hash if the database is secure. Probably not going to be the case with this database, I have a suspicion. And the database contains a table that holds usernames and passwords. You need to determine the name of this table and the columns it contains then retrieve the contents of the table to obtain the username and password of all users. To solve the lab, log in as the administrator user. What we can take away from this is that the users table is not going to be called users as it is in most databases. Furthermore, the username and password columns on that table are not going to be called username and password. The idea is we're going to need to make use of the information schema to first find out what the users table is called and what the username and password columns on the users table are called as well. That way we'll be able to extract the administrator user's password. So we understand on a conceptual level what we're doing here. So let's fire up the lab. So we see that we have a shop style page. The idea here is we can refine our search for products by clicking on various categories. For example, if I click on the gifts category, it's only going to return products from the database that fall under the category of gifts. And we can see that represented in the query string, everything after the question mark, category equals gifts. So there's a visualization of a possible SQL query that's taking place on the back end. It is fictional. I don't know the exact query that's taking place, but I do see for each of these products, there appears to be two components. There seems to be a title and a description. So that could even be the names of the columns from a table that's perhaps called products. With SQL, we know it's possible to combine the results of one SQL query with a second query made against a second table. It's called a union select. This is what's meant by union attack. This means if we are able to append onto the end of the original query, we can basically write a second select query. We can just retrieve arbitrary information from the database. Now there are a couple of caveats here. Firstly, we need to return the same number of results. So we're asking for two columns here. We're asking for title and description. So with our union select, we have to ask for two pieces of information to be returned as part of the union select query. The second caveat is that if we want to retrieve information from the underlying database, we need to know what the various tables and columns are called. Otherwise we can't extract that information. So we're now in the repeater tab in Burp and we can see a copy of the HTTP request that returned products from the category gifts. And we've seen conceptually what we're looking to do with that SQL query. So let's see if we can append to the end of the existing query gifts. So we know that's going to end with a single quote generally. Anytime we want to make use of a space, the URL encoded value is going to be the plus. Now, as it happens, if we don't make use of URL encoded space, this attack is still going to work in this case, but it's generally good practice to URL encode values here. Gifts, union. So normally we capitalize in SQL, but SQL does typically work if you don't capitalize. But again, let's follow good practice here. Union select. And just to test that this is union injectable. One thing we can do is actually just select strings from the database. Union select ABC, comma, space character, DEF, space character, from, 
well, actually, as it happens, we don't necessarily need from in this case. Some SQL databases do require you to choose a table to select from, whereas others don't. Now, one of the other interesting things about the SQL query language, which maybe seems counterintuitive at first, is that we're just selecting arbitrary strings. We're not selecting them from a database as such. We can just simply get SQL to return the strings ABC and DEF as a result. Some SQL databases require us to use from, even though we're not technically selecting from any database, whereas the database on the back end here doesn't require us to specify a from table. So we have union select ABC, DEF, that's it, end of the query. Let's click send. Let's have a look at the response. And if we scroll down, we're going to see our products returned, but beneath all of the products, we see the strings ABC and DEF returned. And just to make things even more straightforward, we don't actually need to specify the category GIFs because let's be honest, we're just not too interested in the actual products that are being returned from the database. So if I click send, now you can see the only thing we get returned in this case is the results of the union select part of our query, ABC, DEF. So at this stage, we've confirmed two things. We've confirmed that this particular parameter, the category parameter is union injectable. And we know that the first half of the query must be asking for exactly two pieces of data. Otherwise this would be an unbalanced union select query and it wouldn't work. Now Port Swigger has an SQL cheat sheet. We've referenced it already to look at the differences between listing the contents of the database in Oracle and other databases. And we've seen that we're interested in this information underscore schema dot tables and we can see the output that's being returned from a select all statement run on that table. You can see some of the headings here, table catalog, table schema, table name. This is what we're interested in because in this case, we know our users table is not going to be called users. It's going to be called something less obvious. One of the cool things about this lab is it appears that the users table might be dynamic. In other words, it changes for each instance of the lab. So there are no shortcuts here. You're going to have to run the SQL injection attack to figure out what the users table is actually called in your version of the database. So let's return to our union injection attack. Now we're going to select table underscore name. And part of the trick here is that we have to select a second value because we know the first half of this SQL query has two values returned. We have to select a second value. There's no reason why we can't just leave it as DEF, the string in this case. And table name is no longer a string because it actually refers to a column in the table. So we can remove the single quotes from table name. Union select table name DEF. Now in this case, we are definitely running the query against a specific table. So going to need plus from plus. And we know the name of the table here from the cheat sheet information underscore schema dot tables. Okay, let's run that. Let's take a look. So we get two values returned. We get the name of the table, then we get DEF. Now, one of the ways we might be able to tidy this up is just by returning null. So we don't have all of these extra DEFs as part of the output. Let's run that. So now we simply get the names of the tables. So PG partition table, PG available extensions versions. Okay, clearly there's quite a few different tables in the database. We need something that is to do with users. Let's just make use of the search functionality. We'll type users. That looks like the users database, users underscore NLDYOB. So you can see that there is an arbitrary string appended to the end of that. So you'll need to be able to figure out what it's called in your case. Now returning to the cheat sheet, we can see that the SQL database will also have an information underscore schema dot columns table, which is going to list all of the columns in the individual table. And also as part of that database entry, it will tell us which table each of those columns belong to. In fact, we have an example here, select all from information underscore schema dot columns where table name equals users. Well, we already know the table name. We've just retrieved it from the database. So if we can select we don't need to select everything in this case. We're actually interested in just the column name really. So if we have an SQL query, select column name and null from information underscore schema dot columns where table name equals the user's value that we've just extracted, we should be able to get the names of the columns. Okay, let's modify our injection attack. So we don't want table name, we want column name. We can select null because we know we have to request two things from instead of information underscore schema dot tables, it's now information schema dot columns. And we also need to provide a where clause here. So where table underscore name. So this is actually a column in the information schema dot columns table where table name equals we need to pass a string because it's referencing something in the database as an entry 
users underscore NLDYOB. Okay, let's run that, see what we get. Okay, it seems that we just need to add an equal sign in this case where table name equals, so that's the missing piece of information here. Let's send that to the back end. This time we get a response and these are the names of the columns in the users table. So we can see they're not called username and password. We can see username is username underscore plus a string. And then we also have password underscore plus a string. So now we know the name of the table and we know the name of the two columns that we want to extract from that table. So union select. So we want to extract password underscore G Q C L O W. And also instead of null, we can make use of our second piece of data username underscore HMUTVY from not information schema dot columns this time, we're actually going to extract it from the name of our users table. So we can delete a decent chunk of this query from users underscore NLDYOB. We don't need it as a string this time because it's actually referencing a table rather than an entry in a table or a piece of data in a table. So union select password username from the users table. Then we have our comment character. Okay, let's send that to the back end. Now you can see we're back to receiving two pieces of data from the database. We've requested the password first. So we have a password. Then we have the user associated with that password. We're not interested in Wiener. We're not interested in Carlos. We're interested in administrator. And this is the administrator password retrieved from the database. Now, what should happen in reality is that we've done all of this work and what we should be receiving back here is a hashed version of the password. In other words, we still can't break into the administrator account because we need to run some kind of dictionary attack against that hash. But in this case, this is actually a plain text password. So this is why defense in depth is important. There should be layers to the security here because even when we get this far, we shouldn't actually be able to penetrate the administrator account. But because this is a plain text password stored in the database, all we have to do is head to the login window. So let's click on my account. We're not logged in. So it's going to give us the login box. Let's paste the password login. Your username is administrator. We are successfully logged in as admin and we get the flag. Congratulations, you solved the lab. Most of the information is contained in the cheat sheet here. If you head to the documentation here on the left, SQL injection, cheat sheet, you get all kinds of things, string concatenation, comments, etc. It's going to be slightly different for different versions of the database. And you can see under database contents for Microsoft SQL, select from information schema, PostgreSQL, select from information schema, MySQL, select from information schema, Oracle, select all from all tab columns where table name equals. So we can see instead of information schema.columns, we have all tab columns. So pretty similar idea, but it's going to be a different process for extracting from Oracle. So if you do determine that it's Oracle running on the back end, then using information schema.columns to extract the table schema is going to be ineffective because Oracle uses a different system. All right, that's pretty much it for this lab. Hope it was helpful. Thanks very much for watching. Catch you guys in the next lab.